You're with your child at the neighborhood playground. All the children stop playing and suddenly form a circle. One steps behind the rest, runs around them and tags your child. All then lock arms with one another. Your child solemnly steps into the circle. In a bright flash, they disappear. You need my help. This is a voice from darkness. Hello, this is Dr. Malcolm Ryder, parapsychologist. Here, as always, to answer your paranormal questions, warn you of strange events unfolding, and take your calls regarding the most dire of circumstances. That said, we already have a caller on the line. Someone I'm surprised to hear from, to be honest, as this person is, uh, well, uh, an old, acquaintance of mine, whom I haven't spoken with in years. They claim to have something I want. Uh, well, we'll find out what that is, I suppose, together in the second half of our show. First, though, we go to National Alerts. National Alerts. This alert is for Fairhope, Alabama. For the past four nights, windows and doors have disappeared from homes and buildings across the town. I do not mean to suggest they're being stolen. No, the doors and windows of Fairhope are literally disappearing, leaving behind walls with no method of entry or escape. In all cases, the fire department has arrived, broken through the walls to rescue those trapped inside. But in each case, there are no living persons. Only the mummified remains of former Fairhope residents. The city council advises sleeping outdoors until the cause of this anomaly is discovered. So, if you're in Fairhope, Alabama, please be careful when indoors. That is the only national alert for this week. Onward to quick questions. Do you have a question you'd like me to answer? Feel free to write us at a voice from darkness at gmail.com or tweet us at VFDarkness. That's a voice from darkness at gmail.com or tweet at VFDarkness. Our first question comes to us via email from Gray. Dr. Ryder, they write. I'm still in school, and recently, when walking down the hallway, I turned the corner to another hall, and it was empty, deserted. But it was the middle of the day. Between classes, there should have been dozens of students. I had to get to my next class, so I rushed to where I thought I was supposed to be. I got to the classroom door and was about to go in, but the woman standing at the front... Her hair was a different color and style than my teacher's. She was staring at the back of the room. All the students were lined up with their noses to the wall. Confused, I wasn't sure what to do. I was supposed to have class there. At least I thought I was. One of the students turned in my direction, glanced at me, but quickly turned back to the wall, now shaking with fear. The teacher told the students, Do not look at the door. Do not look at her. She'll go away soon. She'll leave us alone. She won't hurt us this time if we don't look at her. She never stays more than a few minutes. Don't worry. I ran back down the hall around the corner, and I was safe in a normal hallway, a hallway in my school. Dr. Ryder, what happened to me? Where did I go? The teacher made it sound like I've been there before, but I haven't. What does this all mean? What do I do? Gray, I'm afraid you've found yourself in a complicated situation. You're likely stumbling into an alternate reality, one that bears some superficial similarities to ours, but is otherwise quite different, especially with how time flows there. Now, I could give you a dozen different home remedies that are supposed to prevent transversing realities, like carrying a broken pocket watch in your left pocket, but 
Frankly, these solutions never work. The best advice I can give you is when you find yourself in this alternate place, and I'm sorry, but you likely will find yourself there at least a few more times, don't stay more than a few minutes, and try not to harm the students there. Sometime in their past, your future, you'll inevitably do something to scare them. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, alia yakta est, the die is cast. As many as 6,000 Americans a year slip into an alternate reality, either temporarily or permanently, most likely without even realizing it. This is how we get phenomena such as the Mandela effect. It's rarely a fatal condition. I'm sure you'll come out on the other end just fine. I'm afraid that's the only question we have time for today. Shortly, we'll hear from our caller on the line who claims to have something I want. We'll find out what that is after Today in Art America. Today in Art America, we find ourselves in Andover, Massachusetts. There, on this day in 1962, the sexually transmitted language of Lynn ceased to exist. The first known speaker of Lynn dates back to the Battle of Stones River in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. A woman described as having olive skin tone and raven black hair appeared at the Union encampment on December 31st, 1862. A young officer, Captain James Vlynn, took her back to his tent that evening. The next morning, he was incapable of speaking English. The woman's name is unknown to this day. James Vlynn shot her the morning of January 1st. She was buried in an unmarked grave. It's unclear if she was the original speaker and patient zero of the sexually transmitted language, or if she too was merely a victim. Captain James Vlynn was unable to communicate in any known language through spoken word or writing. Everything he said aloud was alien to those who heard him. Everything he wrote, indecipherable. He was sent back north after the battle, examined by doctors. Through one of the Union doctors, Daniel Foster, we have the first attempt at creating a Vlynn alphabet. According to Dr. Foster's journal, he worked with James Vlynn for weeks in an attempt to cure or understand him. He failed in both efforts. James Flynn was sent back to his family in Massachusetts. He became prone to emotional outbursts when attempting to communicate with his family, either angry or bursting into tears when they were unable to understand anything beyond his most simple wants. Journal entries and letters from his family in that period tell of their extended efforts to reteach him English or to learn his new language. All attempts failed. Four months after his arrival back home, the family's maid lost her ability to speak English. She too could now only speak in the sexually transmitted language. James Flynn's spirits rose during this time, though the Flynn family found themselves mired in scandal. It was unclear if James had forced himself on the maid, a woman named Stephanie Sanders, or if she'd gone to him willingly. A small house was built on the far lot of the Flynn estate. James and Stephanie were wed and moved into their new home. A year later, they had their first child. Less than 10 months after the birth, the child could seemingly speak basic words of the sexually transmitted language, though it never did learn English. None of the eight children James and Stephanie had did. 
The children and parents became regular research subjects at Harvard. Linguists, medical doctors, biologists all attempted to discover why the parents lost the ability to understand any language but Vlin, and why the children were incapable of learning any language but it. Research papers and books were written about the Vlin family, but no answer was discovered. After several years of study, academics and the public lost interest in the strange linguistic phenomena. That is, until 1894, when an outbreak of the language occurred in Boston. Over the course of a three-month period, over 300 men and a few dozen women lost their ability to speak or read English, but gained the ability to understand Flynn. The cause of the outbreak was traced back to Mary and Rebecca Flynn, daughters of James and Stephanie. Both women were in their thirties, thought to be unweddable by the English-speaking side of the family. They disappeared from the Flynn estate sometime in the early 1890s. A judge found them guilty of both prostitution and willfully spreading a disease. For the latter crime, they were sentenced to death. All the new speakers of Lynn were forcibly removed from their homes in Boston and relocated to land in the town of Andover. High walls and armed guards were posted around the area. No official records corroborate this. However, it's widely believed those inside the community were castrated to further prevent the spread of Flynn. The shelters in the Andover community were of terrible quality, not able to keep rain or wind fully out. All those inside the walls were reliant on a single well for fresh water. Journalists and academics were discouraged from further reporting on the language of Flynn and the Andover community. In one case, a journalist at the Boston Herald who attempted to write on their harsh living conditions was found dead in a hotel room with two bullet holes in the back of his head. His death ruled a suicide. The subject of Flynn died out nationally after the outbreak of the First World War. In 1917, Patrick Baker, a Catholic theologian and pacifist, gave a speech where he stated his belief that the language of Vlin was the original tongue man spoke before the fall of the Tower of Babel, and God had finally forgiven mankind. He believed God wanted all people to become infected with the language to better understand one another and to come together in world peace. Baker was denounced by the Catholic Church and imprisoned under the Espionage Act of 1917 for speaking out against the war. This had a dampening effect on anyone else speaking out in favor of those infected with the language. During the Second World War, comparisons were made between Andover and the Japanese internment camps. Still, nothing further was done to help the Andover community. What happened to the speakers of Lynn between the end of the Second World War and the early 60s is a mystery. Many journals written in Lynn exist, but remain untranslated. All we know for sure is that every speaker of the language died of either disease, old age, or other causes during that period. Until finally, on this day in 1962, the last speaker of Flynn passed away. The language disappeared from the earth just shy of being a century old. Despite the work of scholars and doctors, not a single word has been translated to this day. Conspiracy theorists believe the government preserved the language by freezing bodily fluids from members of the Andover community. And so it might be possible someday another outbreak occurs, perhaps even at the global level. 
Contrary to this view, some theologians now accept the Baker heresy and believe God gave us one chance to again be united with a single language, and we rejected that gift. I do not hold either belief myself, but do think it's tragic when a language leaves the world. With it goes an ephemeral piece of humanity that we likely cannot ever get back. Now back to our main show. And we're back. On the line, we have an old acquaintance of mine. Someone I'm surprised to hear from, to be honest. And I'm surprised you took my call, Malcolm. Figured you'd forgotten about old Alec Bird. Hmm. You said you have something I want? I'm curious to know what that is. My last year at Ravenswood. There was a time we drank at the Queen of Cups. You, me, most of the old crew. Do you remember? We went there many times. You'd have to be more specific. But, Alec, I'm not interested in talking about drinking stories from college. Why did you call? Context is key, Malcolm. I'll tell you what I have. But I want you to understand why I have it. Fine. Go on. This time at the Queen, five of us were there. You, Sonia, Charlotte, me, and Julian. Normally, we'd all only stay for a few rounds, joke about something stupid we heard an undergrad say, or try to out-know it all each other. This particular time, though, we asked each other the one question we'd all avoided. Do you remember what that was? What are you afraid of? It's so funny. All of us were studying the supernatural. In a sense, studying the greatest cause of fear talking about it in dry, technical, academic terms, completely refusing to engage with this deep, primal emotion on any personal level. Well, everyone except Julian. But look what happened to him. What do you have that I want, Alec? I swear, if you only called into my show That story to... you told the other week about your granddad and his shadow... About how when you were a boy and he cut off his shadow and it came at you. You told the four of us that same story that night at the Queen. Said shadows still spooked you, gave you nightmares. Yes, it was a traumatic event from my childhood. These sorts of things hold a power over us even as we age. A few months after that night, you had me kicked out of Ravenswood. I exaggerated some research. No, fabricated. Fabricated. You fabricated results, giving credence to a false method for removing ghosts from a haunting. If your made-up data had been taken seriously by anyone, people would have been hurt. It wasn't false. I just... just embellished a bit. I had to, otherwise I would have lost my fellowship. Not that that really mattered in the end. You ratted me out. I made sure no one got hurt from your false claims. Alec, what is it that you have that you think I want? Your granddad's shadow knife. How? Th that's impossible. He never would have entrusted something so dangerous to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just funny, right? You deal with the unwelcome riders cities that appear out of nowhere so many actually impossible things but old alec bird possessing your granddad's shadow knife strains the credulity of dr malcolm Ryder. why why do you have the 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 the, uh, the, the knife duncan Ryder was one of my favorite professors it would have been rude of me to leave the island without saying goodbye. During that final visit, he left me alone in his study while he got us drinks. In that moment, I admitted to myself why I was truly there. To steal the knife. To then use it to take vengeance against you. I was partially successful. You intended on cutting your shadow off and having it attack me? 
my plan. Well, there was no plan. None of this was thought out. I should have listened better to your story. The great Duncan Ryder couldn't control his shadow for more than a few minutes after he'd cut it from himself. I don't know what made me think I'd have better results. I cut my shadow off in one of the courtyards on campus and told it to go find you. I didn't say to kill you. I don't think I did. Not that it mattered. Thirty seconds after I severed it, it stopped listening. It stealthed away into the darkness of the night. How did you get it back? I didn't. For nearly twenty years now, I've walked this world without a shadow. Don't get me wrong, I tried to get it back. Stayed a few days longer on Mackinac than I intended. After a while, though, they wouldn't let me on university grounds. You could have told someone, anyone, any of us, even if you were furious at me, Charlotte, Sonia, they would have helped you. You could have gone back to my grandfather. Are you even thinking that through? I was the grad student they just kicked out. And what, I go back not a week later and tell them I practiced some ancient form of black magic I didn't even understand? To scare or possibly kill the student who turned me in? No. I didn't tell anyone. And when I wasn't allowed back on school grounds, that was that. I went to other libraries in other parts of the country, dark arts practitioners, did research. No such luck, though. As I said, going on 20 years. No such luck. Why come forward now? I've run out of time. Julian's after me. He knows I have the knife, and he wants it. I don't know what for, but I need your help, Malcolm. I need protection. Can you meet me on the island? At the Queen of Cups, in two days? Bring the knife. Return it to me. And I'll be there. I don't want that evil little thing. It's all yours. See you in a few days. All right. Uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. And I have some travel arrangements to make, so... Remember, if you're experiencing anything paranormal, supernatural, otherworldly, please feel free to call in next time on A Voice From Darkness. Thanks for listening to A Voice From Darkness. That was Kristen Holland as Dr. Malcolm Ryder and Matt Case as Alec Bird. Kristen comes to us courtesy of the Nocturnal Transmissions Short Horror Story Podcast. If you'd like to hear more of his work, search for Nocturnal Transmissions wherever good podcasts are purveyed. On our next bonus episode, we'll check back in with someone who's called into the show before and now finds themselves allied with a traveling salesman. Can they be persuaded to walk a different path? You'll find out next time. Until then, I'm Jack Reese. Thank you for listening.